<laughs> well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, hope you've had a good break and are fully recharged and such. Uh, so I'm Jason Cable. I'm the director of the Landberg Institute for Civic and Global Affairs, and I'm very pleased to be introducing our next speaker in this series uh, for this uh, for this year. Um, before turning to the proper introduction, I want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, so first, uh, actually the last talk in our series, it's all very sad, uh, the last talk in our series um, is going to be on understanding urban food issues, sources, policies, and ways forward. And it's actually going to be an alumni panel. Uh, so we're having uh, Courtney Ahern, uh, class of 2010, who's done work with Feeding America, uh, Jen Ruciano, uh, also of 10, uh, with the Detroit Food Academy, and Mark, Mark von Toppel of uh, 01, who's now with the DC Department of Human Services. Uh, they're all going to be coming in and sharing their experiences and, uh, yeah, on a wide variety of sort of urban food issues and ways forward with those. So that's going to be happening on Monday, April 11th at 4.30, and that's going to be in Ho 101. So there's that coming up. Uh, a couple of other just short announcements. So, uh, first announcement. so we'll be officially announcing the recipients of several Lampert programs this week. Uh, so that'll include our faculty scholars, the Lampert Fellows in Public Affairs for this upcoming summer, and also our summer language scholarships. Uh, those will be announced later this week. And early next week, hold your breath, um, we'll be announcing our annual theme for next year. And of course, I could just tell you now, but no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> We're going to build anticipation here. Um, that will be announced next week. Um, stay tuned. Um, okay, so that, those are the housekeeping announcements. Um, now, now for the main actual event. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be introducing Professor Rashid Smila, uh, coming to us from the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia where he's the director of the Fisheries Economics Research Unit. He received his uh, Bachelor's of Science degree from Amadou Bello University in Nigeria and his PhD in Economics from the University of Bergen. Uh, that's in Norway, so international. Um, and he really is an international and internationally recognized scholar. Um, he's the lead or co-author for well over 100 articles um, and that's probably closer to 200 if you include various book chapters and so on. Um, he's a frequently pre appeared in the popular media in interviews and so on, particularly in Canada. He shows up on the CBC, if you know the CBC. Uh, he shows up there quite a bit um, on various fishing and fisheries issues. Um, another way of looking at this, um, and of course I was looking up at his CV and so on, uh, just preparing for this. His CV is about 44 pages long. And it's not filler. It's like 44 solid pages of stuff. Um, it's kind of intimidating for fellow academics, I think. <laughs> um, you know, he's really well cited, and he's truly a leading figure in his field. Um, so we're really lucky to have him here today to present his talk, uh, High Seas Fishing and its Impacts on the Citizens of Developing Nations. Uh, please join me in welcome. So, thank you so much for the introduction. It's amazing when a lot of people uh, introduce you the kind of things they say, right? <laughs> Sometimes you don't expect them, so thank you for this. And thank you for the program for giving me the chance to come here and share the work of my group and uh, the larger community of fisheries, uh, scientists and economists. Yeah, I understand this is part of your food series and uh, fish is an important food item, isn't it? How many of you eat fish? Yeah, that's already a good number. And many people around the world eat fish, as you know, and I will be touching on that as, as we go. So I thought I should start from the, the, the whole fisheries business uh, before focusing on the high seas. And my first point is that fish and fisheries are important to people in several different ways. Uh, first, as food, right? Food and nutritional security, very important service that uh, the world's marine fisheries uh, provide for us. Just to give you some numbers, we take about, officially, according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, we take about 80 million tons of fish a year from the ocean. 80 million tons, in fact. 
estimates put the number more like 120 million because of illegal fishing, unreported fishing, recreational fishing. So think of this, 120 million tons of fish. If you convert this into number of mature cows, right, number of mature cows in terms of weight, that will be 120 million mature cows that we pull out of the ocean each year, right? That's larger than all the cows we slaughter on our farms globally, almost two times actually, according to some numbers. So this is a lot of food, right? A lot of animal protein, and it's also good animal protein. It's it's better than, than beef, right? In terms of the health. So this is this is um, this is a very big uh, source of uh, food. The other thing is economic security. Uh, this 120 million tons of Fish, if you take the average price of a ton of fish in the world, is about 1,000 to 1,500 US dollars uh, a ton. So, again, we're talking about lots of dollars here, even for a big country like the US. 150 billion dollars of fish at the dock, right? The value. And if you take in the multiplier effect, the added value through the economy, we're talking at about 400 billion dollars pumped into the global economy. So in terms of economics, it's, it's important. Especially because the communities where most of this activity takes place are actually depressed in terms of economics. So but sometimes I feel like a dollar is not the same, right? A dollar on Wall Street is probably not the same as a dollar in a small poor community, if you think of it, in terms of the value. So, then there is job, uh, job security, and I think this is a huge social function that the global fisheries are providing for us. According to our, our estimates, about 260 million people around the world earn some income through fishing or through some fishing-related economic activity. 260 million people. And if you take the top 10, most of these are large developing countries, India, China. Right? Vietnam, Nigeria, right? You have them there. And the social function, to me, this is probably the most important <coughs> function that our fish stocks provide to us. Most of these 260 million people will have no other job to go to if it's not for fishing. Because education is low, they don't have skills, they cannot just walk into a new job. And can you imagine having 100 million people just sitting down doing nothing in the world? The headache for all of us, right? Social problems. So, so that I really find to be a, a huge, a huge help for all of us. Recreational and cultural values. Some of you probably do angling and you go out and have fun catching fish. Cultural values. One of my PhD students actually studied the spiritual value of fish in British Columbia. People just go out to the ocean and they meditate and have some values. Economies have no way of even estimating, right? So this is uh, very important. And then there is the ecosystem function. Fish performs a lot of ecosystem function, including carbon sequestration. There's new research coming up showing the movement of animals in the ocean, taking carbon down and hiding it away from us, you know, thinking of climate change. So there are lots of useful things happening out there. Now, at the same time, there are issues with, with fisheries, lots of threats. You have overfishing, and fishing down the marine food web, which was made uh, famous by Daniel Pauli, one of our colleagues. He talks about how, looking at the data, we take the big, pricey, valuable fish, and with time, we're just reducing the size and the value, and he predicts that in the very soon we'll all be eating jellyfish. <laughs> Has anyone eaten jellyfish in this room before? Ah, you haven't been to China? Yeah, okay, I see, yeah. They always serve it on the, on the table, I mean, it's, and it's, it's not tasty. You have to pour a lot of soy sauce, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little raw bread, boring stuff. But <clears throat> if we continue, this is the fear for most of us, and we're beginning to see elements of it, uh, evidence of this around the world. Then you have the garbage, pollution, plastic in the ocean, oil spills, you know. You name it, all sorts of issues. Uh, so we have a big job to do, all of us, right? How to protect this very important part of part of our earth. In fact, it's larger than, than 
Papas, you know, right? Seventy percent of the of the of, of, of Earth is actually water and ocean. And then there's the people, climate change. Lots of evidence showing that sea surface temperature rising, ocean acidification, uh, when the temperature of the ocean uh, rises, I mean, like every animal, you have a range of tolerable temperature, right? We are a typical example of that. But unlike us, where we can put the heat on when it's too cold, or put an air condition when it is too warm, the fish don't have that. So those, those that can move and follow the temperature do move, and those, those that cannot perish, right? So there are consequences. goes through individual fish populations and fish communities and the whole ecosystem, and you can follow this. I follow this into the economic impact and so on, and some of our papers have looked at that in, say, West Africa, in Mexico, in the U.S., see the consequences of it. Ocean acidification is happening. And according to the science, because the temperature is increasing, fish are generally moving towards the north coast and also into deeper waters. So, lots of consequences, right? So, and then when you move and move and move, you get to the Arctic. Where do you go next? Maybe you fall off the cave, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, there are all sorts of things that uh, are happening with that. So, this few slides is just to give you the general uh, picture. Fish are important. They are under threat, threat from various sources, and therefore we need to do more research, more science, understand these things, and find ways to mitigate and manage the resources. Not only for us, but also for future generations, you know. If you enjoy fish, you want your sons and daughters and grandchildren to also enjoy it, I suspect, right? Is there no one who doesn't want that to happen? Oh, let me have the fish. No, nobody is going to come. So now let's get to the high seas. <coughs> this is our global ocean, and these areas are what are described as exclusive economic zones of countries, the EEZs of countries. Exclusive. This was agreed upon in 1982 uh, at the UN by the world, to where they agreed that areas from 200 nautical miles away from your coast is the country's waters. It's yours. You own it in a way. You, you don't take care of it. So if you look at here, South Africa, from the coast to here is about 200 nautical miles, and that's South African waters, okay? And it's the same all over. Where is the U.S. and Canada? You have that. Now, these deep blue areas are what? That is the remaining after you've taken your 200 north cameras, whatever remains in the middle of the ocean is called the high seas, okay? These are little islands, so this is their EEZs, and then the rest of it is, that is 58% of the, uh, the ocean surface. 42% is within the EEZ, 58% within the high <coughs> seas. Now, when they did this division, biologists, informed the world that most of the production of fish is actually within this zone around the continental shelf by the coast. That's the productive part. The rest of it is quite empty of fish. In fact, the estimate was about 10%, and that's still true. We see about 10 to 12% of global catches coming from the high seas. But as we continue overfishing our coast, what do we do? We move and move in, so there is more and more fishing activity in the high seas, and this is causing a lot of concerns uh, by scientists and managers, right? And so I'm going to talk a bit uh, more about that. One thing you should notice that this is our own people. We people, we made this. The fish don't know this. They don't recognize it. They go where they go. They don't need visa, right? Fish comes in. We don't need any fish. So, so even though we divide the global ocean into Arctic, <coughs> Atlantic, and whatnot. Actually, they are interconnected, and this is a big team for, for us in our group. We try to look at this as a, what we call the appropriate scale. If you just think of your own backyard, that will not do it, because it's all connected. All right, that's the high seas and the EEZs. Now, what kind of fish live there? Uh, lots of large pelagic species like the tunas of the world. 
They, they, and, and they don't live there, but they, 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 they migrate along, highly migratory species. They go through so many country waters and the high seas in their lifetime. That is if they are not caught, right, by somebody. So, and uh, one of, Stephanie, one of our students looked at it, she tried to track the number of country waters that bluefin tuna goes through in a lifetime, and she counted 43 countries for one of them. So, so this is really migratory, international global fish. And, uh, and then we have these kinds of species in the deep and high seas that are, they are not pelagic, they are quite special species, many of them. Very slow, they grow, in terms of growth, they grow very slowly, they live deep, where there's no sunlight, not a lot of fish, not a lot of uh, food, I mean, for them. So they have to be very adaptive to their system, and therefore they grow very slowly. They live very long, some of them more than people, actually. Some of them live over 100 years. Alfonsino, have you heard of that, the name of a fish called Alfonsino? It even sounds like a person, right? Alfonsino, and they have orange roughy and so on. So this species, many of us are very concerned because if you catch them, it's so hard for them to come back, right? Because they grow so slowly. So these are the two tails, the big pelagic ones, and, and, and they, they live in very sensitive habitats like this, right? Uh, and to get hold of some of this, you, you end up destroying the habitat also. So habitat destruction and so Very delicate part of the ocean to be fishing, or big trawlers, for example. So, so this high seas fishing has kind of bothered me for, for some time. Years ago, this was published in 2005. I think I came from a conference talking about climate change and I was in the plane flying back to Vancouver and thinking about fishing in the high seas, whether it makes sense at all, you know. And because the travel time, you have to travel further, you burn a lot of uh, CO, you burn a lot of uh, CO, and so So I started thinking about it. When I came back, we had our group meeting, and I, I told them, you know what, how about we do a paper and say, let's stop fishing in the high seas, it probably makes sense. And they thought I was crazy. And our group is one group that is out there in terms of sustainability, but even they thought I was crazy. So I couldn't, I wanted to say, close the high seas to fishing, but I couldn't do that because I didn't get support from the team, right? So what I did, I did a little trick there. I said, okay, let's just look at what the potential costs and benefits are. And so this is a table which is in there. See here, if you close 100%, this is why you lose in terms of catch. Catch, 7.5 million tons, which is about 9% of the total global catch. And this is the money, the revenue will use, lose 13.5 billion. But this is the profit, roughly, the companies that fish there make, about 1.35 billion. So, so I said, see, we can, give, we can just pay them off. And, and leave the fish alone and protect the thing. So I kind of did this quietly without actually saying a big headline, close the high seas. So that was the beginning, all right? But it was there, in between the lines, you could put it. And we looked at the jobs, not many jobs. These are big boats, they're very factory trawlers, they don't. And they don't feed people much, apart from the tunas. The, the, the others are just, in fact, they use some of them to make Fragrance, huh? perfumes. Some of the deep sea fish, fish they catch, they turn them into nice fresh, nice, you know, and, and, and sell them. So, so that was the first thing. Then uh, I think in this is what 2016, about 2013, the new global commission was was created by a group of NGOs. They call it the Global Ocean Commission. And they were given the mandate to help the world manage the high seas, just to find out what the world needs to do. And these are really high level uh, global leaders in, in, in former, former politicians, ministers of finance, and business leaders. Let's see who can I give as an example. The former Prime Minister of Canada, Paul Martin, is a member of that. Um, 
David Miliband, former foreign secretary of the UK. Huh? Trevor Manuel, former uh, finance minister, Mandela's first finance minister, South Africa. Then we had Abi, the chief Nigerian minister of plan. So these are the kind of people. And John Podesta was actually on it until Obama called him <coughs> to the White House. So we, we lost him sort of. And, and I was one of the scientists they put together to kind of advise them. I was looking at the economic plan. So, so I managed to get this thing about closing the houses in the report. I'll show you some of the numbers we played around. This is one of the reports they issued. And, and then, and then I followed this up. This is me and the group here. In 2015, we, we said, okay, if you want to talk about closing, let's look at winners and losers because some countries will lose, some will gain, even if the globally will gain that the losers will not like it, right? How do you deal with that? So it's just giving more information to help the world make a, make a decision. And I will, I will show you some of the things we did. All right? Now, back to the trust. I told you in general, the trust to, to the ocean in general. But the high seas, these are some of the things, key points to note. Inadequate management. In this paper, they evaluated all the management of the high seas, and in general, the, the report was really negative. We are not doing a good job. At the moment, we have regional fisheries management organizations, RFMOs, managing parts of the high seas, right? Countries that have interests come together, like NAFO, North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, US, Canada, and others who have interests come together to manage. So you have them, and this paper, they evaluated their performance, and it wasn't looking good at all. Overfishing and population decline already in the high seas is okay. Bycatch is a big thing, right? You know bycatch, when you target something, and you catch all sorts of other animals that you're <coughs> looking for in the net, right? Huge. And habitat destruction, because if you use bottom trawlers and catch the bottom line, you just blow up and delicate, delicate that in the ecosystems. Uh, further information, decline in tuna populations. There's a paper that kind of showed that, in general, we see that the adult biomass of tunas and their relatives within different oceans are not looking good. You see the, so there are issues with uh, fishing in the high seas. Additional considerations. I mentioned that some of the deep sea are very slow growing and, and long lived. That makes them very vulnerable, right? Uh, in this paper, we, we look at that. We almost compare it to economics. You know, you know the idea that if your fish is more valuable in the bank than in the ocean, commercial fishers would like to empty the ocean and turn the fish into money in the bank. Have you heard about that? Does it make sense to you? See here, you have a certain quantity of fish in the ocean, and the fish has got its natural growth rate, right? Everything being equal, they grow by, say, 5%, 0.05 is the growth rate, internal growth rate of the fish. So each year, they, they, they grow by 5% if you don't touch them. Now, imagine you take that fish, you sell it, make some money, and put it in the stock market. And the stock market gives you 10%, right? So which one would you prefer? 10% or 5%? If you are an economist, you go for, that's part of the reason we are emptying the ocean, actually. And these, the species in here, are really vulnerable to that. So very vulnerable, very valuable and slow growing. You are toast, you end up in somebody's bank account, right? And, and that means future generations will not have that fish to eat. Now, much of the deep sea is unexplored and poorly understood. This is another reason why we should watch what we do in there. Right? If you don't know enough about something, you better be careful, because otherwise you can cause harm. Right? So that is, we need more science before we can do a lot here. Yeah, this is connected to that. So we don't actually know. When you take all those big boats in there, 
wrecking the bottle, we don't actually understand. And many high seas fisheries will not be viable without government subsidies. And in 20, it's 2007 already. Have you realized that time flies? Maybe it's not flying for you guys because you're studying. <laughs> After some time, it just goes too fast. It's 2007. And what we did in the paper, we look at the fish, the stocks, uh, the boats that are fishing in, in the deep sea, high sea, and did the economics. And what we found out is that they make about 10% profit, but the government subsidy they get is 25% of their total revenue. So 10%, 25. Which means that without subsidies, most of them will go bankrupt, right? So we are paying them to go cause trouble and mess up the system. And so this is also the point to, to, to have it. Now, and then, this is a big point for our paper. Ocean predators forage for prey in both EEZs and in the high seas. This is Barbara Block. You can Google Barbara, Barbara Block if you talk about tourists. That's the person in the world. She's at Starbuck. She's known. I mean, she'll get on a big tuna somehow and put the tide on it. It's very famous for, for her good work on tuners. And, and her studies show that. Um, so the fish don't just stay in the high seas. They do come in and out. And a lot of our analysis we base on this, this fact. Okay? Which that means that the depletion of high sea stocks can't influence the availability of fish to coastal fleets, right? If they are so connected, then what you do there doesn't remain there only, it also impact, impacts, and that, that is a uh, key point. So what we did, and before, a, a little bit of nomenclature here, I've already talked about it, but it's probably good to say, uh, fish stocks in the high seas. Imagine you are on the east coast, right? You have Canada up north and you have the US. So these are the countries, very simple, huh? The map is not like this, <laughs> certainly. But just to illustrate. <coughs> and let's say this is 200 nautical miles away from the coast of the US or Canada. There are a number of uh, different species that are described in the literature. This it is the exclusive economic zone of Canada. This is that for US, right? And there are some fish that just go up and down here. They don't go up into, into the, the high seas. So, and we call this transboundary shed. They are shared between two countries, and they're usually called transboundary fish stocks. They go across boundaries, right, of two countries or more. <coughs> Then you have B, fish stocks that live part of their lives in the high seas and part of them in the EEZ of one or more countries, like this fish. Goes in and out, maybe goes there and comes there, you know, so that is that. And then we have the C, these are called the discrete high sea stocks. And some of us call them the offense of the ocean, you know. The offense of the ocean, why? If you're a Canadian fish stock, the Canadian government is there to make sure, you know, as much as possible that something really terrible doesn't happen to you. Similarly, so there is a protector, support, a manager. But if you're out there in the high seas, it's free for all, virtually. So that's why we call them offense of the ocean. So in the study I'm going to show you, a key question we ask is how much of the global catch is actually this one? Because if a big chunk of our fish is all in here, closing the high seas will make them not available for, for us to harvest and, and eat as food, right? So we, we check that. And it turned out that really a very small proportion of the fish we harvest spend all their time in the high seas. So it gave me a bit, a bit of hope, and this is a little diagram. And, and we had this diagram in the Global Ocean Commission report, which was the basis for, for something they said I'll show you. But just look at that. If you look at 42% of the taxa, that's here. The taxa is the fish type, you know, taxa is a biological term. So the type of species or a group of species are called taxa. 42% of them spend their time, straddle, 
between the Hyses and some country Eats. It is in numbers, okay, in numbers. And 57% are caught, they live all their life, or we find them only in the exclusive economic zones of countries. Okay, less than 1.5 spend all their time in the high seas, the offense of the ocean. So really, there is a lot of interaction between the two, a very little isolated fish sitting out there in the high seas. And if you turn this into the tonnage, the catch, 67% are actually fish that we that spend their time in and out, right? This is seven. In terms of value, hey, 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 you're talking about 72% because of the tuners, right? Yeah, they're quite valuable. You know, one tuna, on average, the bluefin sells for about what? $50,000. One tuna. Yeah? That's one year I call it, right? Roughly, right? So that's serious. There was a day I went to the office with my guy, my boy. He was very young then. I don't remember the age, eight or so. And uh, in the evening, I went there. The student was finishing her thesis, so I was working through. There was a table. He saw the price of fish. I said, Dad, what is that? I said, $40,000. Price of fish? One fish? I said, yeah. And then he smiled. I said, you know, if I get eight of them, I'll be a rich guy. You know? <laughs> and then I said, this shows how, how risky these things are. If that guy can see that, you can imagine all the commercial features, right? Eight of them, I'll be rich. So, 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 so this is quite, this figure was quite telling, even to me. I knew there's a lot of interaction, but not this much. So this was uh, a powerful figure. And on the basis of that. <clears throat> and another thing we found when we did the analysis, the 10 leading high seas fishing nations together land 62% of the total catch, and they, they, they capture 71, 70% of the total value in the high seas. Okay? Developing countries will start coming in. I'm sure you are waiting to see the collection. We'll get there. So, 10 leading countries. I think eight of them are from Asia. You talk about Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, Spain. You know, they capture 70% of the total value. There's no developing country there at all. And the high seas is actually supposed to be owned by the global citizens. So it's for everybody, right? It's the EEZ is for countries, but the rest of it is still. Uh, protected for, for, for humanity. So, so this again gives you some, it raises issues regarding distribution, the distributional consent. And according to Carter, it's one of the most enduring practical problems of human societies, how to deal with inequities, right? You know, it's a big discussion uh, in the US too, in the elections, this keeps coming back. <coughs> Think of Benny, huh? Sunless, right? And all that in that. So that's that. And then Stiglitz, Joe Stiglitz. Anyone who knows Joe Stiglitz in this room? Yeah, you know Joe. It's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. So. Why is he? Colombia, huh? Colombia. Uh, he's spending a lot of his uh, retirement years talking about uh, equity a lot. Because he's really worried about that. It believes it has great economic, political, and social consequences in his book, The Price of Inequality. So, so dealing with the high seas fishing is one small way of dealing with, uh, with uh, inequities, from, at least from the ocean. If distant countries capture 70%, the question is, if we close the high seas, how will that and what we see is that smaller countries will have the opportunity to catch fish in their own waters because the fish migrate and they go in and out. So, and, and we see some numbers about that. Okay, whilst we were doing this in our group, uh, Chris Costello and his postdoc, uh, Crow White, at the University of Santa Barbara, they were also thinking about the ISIS and they published this paper in 2014 why they also said they did modeling, they don't, they don't have data like we do, right? If you want fisheries data, you come to us. We have built all sorts of databases globally. 
but they did economic modeling and actually also came to the same conclusion. The fish will do better, there will be better economic gains globally if we close the high seas, which is nice, actually, where you have two groups. And generally, me and him, we, we do agree with it because he is, you can call, a more pure economist. It's how to maximize profit. And I say, we maximize profit, but we also have social and uh, ecological concerns. You get it? Mm -hmm. So, but here we, we agree, which is, which is nice. In fact, we're working together on, on the paper, ISIS uh, closure. Then, based on the strength of those pie, pie charts I showed, the Global Ocean Commission, when they issued their, uh, their, their, when they issued their report two years ago, they had eight proposals, and one of them is this one, creating a high seas regeneration zone. What they said is, we give the world five years to fix the management of the high seas or close it to fishing so that it can serve as a regeneration zone for the world until we know how to fish in the high seas sustainably, right? So they had all the, the right words. So close it, it will give us regeneration and also the day we know how to do it properly, you can open it up, right? Yeah, so that's a, so. and there's a lot of discussion globally about this as we are talking now. The UN is discussing how to manage economic activities in areas beyond national jurisdiction, which is areas beyond EEZs, and that means the high seas actually. So there's a, a full because there are problems. Okay. Now, now let's get to the paper. Yeah. So we set out to do, to do a bit more analysis. And the questions we ask is, what percentage increase in the catch of straddling taxa within EEZs -E would make closing the high seas catch neutral? This is the term I, I point. You know, when we talk about closing the high seas, the first reaction we have is, you are going to take away food from people. Right. Because oh, 10, 10 million tons, what is that? But you, can't, you can't do that, they say. So we said, okay, if this is going to work, we have to at least make sure that globally we do not lose a catch, right? So we say, what, what will be the catch neutral state if we do this? And, and this catch neutral depends on the movement of fish in and out, right? If they move a lot, then they will be available for us to catch, and therefore that can make up. And that is the first question. And then we said, how does this compare with the range of potential increases in the catches predicted by White and Costello in their paper? They had a range of percentages of transfers into the EEZs that they analyzed. They had 10%, so, so the fish in the high system percent are available for catching, you know, an increase in the catch in the EEZ by 10%. Up to 70% will be the wide range of. So we did a comparison there. And then, which countries or political groupings or continents stand to lose or gain? That's the main question of our paper. And how about the distribution? How about the distribution of benefits? So I will show you a few of these. And uh, I send the paper to, yeah, to Jason, and uh, maybe you already have it. So a bit on the method. One of the powerful things we have at our center is we have specialized the global catch of fish into half degree by half degree cells in the global ocean. So that 80 million or 120 million tons I talked to you about, we have allocated it based on ecology and all sorts of things to half degree by half degree cells in the global ocean. And that gives you a lot of power. Connected with the price, we also have the value. Then we run scenarios of increasing total catch of straddling taxa within EEZ. Okay? So if you, the idea is if you close the high seas, you make it something like a fish bank for the world, where the fish can hide, they can grow, they can spawn, get the larvae to move out, adult fish to move out. If there's more concentration, then they will move into the EEZ and you'll catch them. So we did some scenario. 
and then we determine the percentage increase in the catch-ups of these stocks uh, would make by closing that catch neutral, the one I mentioned. And then we did the range from 10 to 70 percent to compare with Costello as well. All right. Given high seas closure, we then analyze the potential change in the catch and value to the world as a whole and to different parts of the world, different countries, small island developing countries, for example. Right? You know there's a group called Small Island Developing Countries? The seats, right? Can you give me an example? Somebody? Example of a seed? Trinidad. Trinidad, yeah, my own country, Trinidad. Yeah, so, so yeah, Trinidad and, and the Caribbean island countries are, we have Pacific island countries, and we have uh, island countries on the west coast of West Africa, like Cape Verde, you know, and so on. So those are the small island developing countries. And of course, and then we look at the distribution by calculating the Gini coefficient. Does that sound like something? Gini coefficient? You know that? This is the economic indicator. It's something we calculate to determine how uneven or how even income distribution is in a given group. So there's a Gini coefficient for the US. There's a Gini coefficient for every country. Right? And so we calculated this. Look at what is happening out there. <laughs> My God. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we, we calculated the Gini for, for the, 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 the revenues made by coastal countries with and without a closure to see what the difference is. Remember I said the top 10 take 70% of the value, right? At the moment, status quo. If you close it, what happens? Just to give an idea, and we'll come back to the Gini. <coughs> Very important uh, indicator, economic one. So, so when we did that, catch neutral is achieved if the catch of struggling taxa, that is the fish that go in and out, increases on average by 18% for all, on average, for all EEZ. So if closing the high seas, leads to an increase in the catch of fish that spend time in and out by 18% within EEZ, then you are catching in trouble. We don't lose any catch globally. Yeah? So that's important because to answer the question, people say, Rishi, you want to close the high seas? How about all the people who want to feed? And 18% and actually is lower than what the model of Castello <coughs> says is possible. According to Costello's model, 42% is what is expected if you close the IC. The increase in the catch of struggling stocks in the EEZ. So this is pretty achievable, right? Even if they make a mistake, right? Remember, these are estimates, this model. So let's say they make a, a mistake by what? 50% will still be good. Yeah? So that's a, a quick one. So that is that was quite good to be able to, 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 to drive this from our data. All right? So, this is a picture for the catch neutral. The blue countries, or is it blue? Something close to blue? Are those that will actually make gains? They will, they will, they will catch more. The US will catch more. Canada too. And then you have many African countries actually will do better. Namibia for some reason. It's not looking good in a few countries here. Uh, Russia, okay. Brazil turned out to be quite uh, uh, negative. Uh, you know, the, the thing determining this is actually the kind of fish dishes you have in your EEZ, right? If you, if you have lots of straddling fish stocks and you don't fish now in the status quo, you don't catch much then you will see again, right? Because then the fish will come to your water so you can catch them. So that's what you're seeing. And this is for the neutral. And 120 countries will benefit, actually. Most of them developing countries. Whereas the 10, the 10 top ones and, and 50 more or 55 more will see declines in their catch. Remember, this is only for the catch neutral. 
Then we ran this for 42%. That was predicted in Costello. And actually, what do you see? You see something like this. Every continent will benefit. See Asia. Asia is big in fish any time you do it. But these smaller countries will also see will also see some gains, right? If you do the 42%. But some countries within them will not. You have to go to see the data. But overall, it's a good thing to do that. Then, this is our Gini coefficient. The calculation, this is what we see here. This is what? Percentage of benefits from the high seas, right? So, 20%, 40, 200 of the total. And benefit here is the total revenue. Okay? We're looking at the top line, total revenue. And here is the percentage of countries. Okay? So, in total, about what? Depending on how you look at it, 144 countries, coastal, or even up to 189 if you count all the territories, right? So, so, so 100% would be, say, 144, and 10% of that, 20% would be what? About 28 countries and so on. This is a percentage of countries. And the Gini coefficient helps you to calculate the relationship between percentage of countries and the income they make. So if a, if, if a system is 100% equal, if equity is 100%, then you will be on the 45 degree line, right? So 20% of the countries make 20%, take 20% of the benefit. 60% take 60%. 100% of course take 100%. So that is the perfect line in terms of income equality, right? Now, in general, no place in the world where this is the case. <coughs> so, usually it's something like this. Alright? And if you look here, the status quo that is currently where we have 10 countries taking 70%, this is the distribution. See? About 50% get nothing. And then if you look here, take almost everything to see that. So, so this one, the, the perfect and equal place will be uh, uh, something like <coughs> zero and the last country takes everything, right? If it's equal, you are here. If it's perfectly unequal, one country takes everything. Then, but the reality zone is here. Now, for the 80 percent scenario, this is what we see. This thing here <coughs> qualifies to that thing here. So actually, many countries see benefits from the high seas if you close the system. In fact, the change is 50 percent. So, this is, this is the larger, the larger the area, the less unequal it is. Okay? So, status quo is 0.66. That is the, co the Gini coefficient of the distribution of revenues from the high seas to coastal countries, okay? 0.66. And that is about the highest if you look at income distribution of countries around the world. The country with the most unequal income distribution is also about 0.66. Can you guess which country that is? Can you guess? Okay. Somebody has to guess, otherwise we don't go. Yeah. It's either Brazil or South Africa, they're generally neck and neck at the top. Yeah, that's, that's very good, actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in many places, when I say they say the US, right? Because the US is in the news a lot. It's actually South Africa. Yeah. It's very unequal. And you know why, right? You know the history of the country, right? So, so it's South Africa. So what I'm saying, and this point three three is one of the best, the countries with one of some of the best distribution in the world. And which one would you guess? That should be much easier than the first one, I think. Think of the world. Why do you think people are more equal in terms of income? Denmark. Denmark. The Scandinavian countries, yeah, yeah. The Scandinavian countries do very well. Yeah. So here you are. By closing the high seas, you turn the distribution of the benefits 
from the high seas, which is owned by all citizens of the world, from the distribution of South Africa to that of Denmark. Which one do you like? Tell me. Which one do you like? That's provided you are not one of the ten, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which one do you like? So that is, uh, people, people really, really like this part of the analysis a lot. Just turning around and using the Gini coefficient in this way to show. And, and, and many of these countries will be, think of Guinea-Bissau, right? Small, poor, the West African country, they don't have the boats to go there, so they can never fish out there. But if you close it, the fish will migrate in and out, and then their little boats can get hold of it. This is the, the power of the whole idea. Okay? Any questions or comments at this point? I know we'll have, I hope we'll have time to, to take questions, so let me just run through here. So these are just some, some of the numbers. With a 42% increase in catches of straddling stocks in EEZ, global catch and landed value actually increases by up to 11%, uh, 11 million tons, which is huge. Uh, and, and the dollars also increase. All continents will, will gain, but some countries within continents will, will lose, and so you have to do some, find a way to deal with that. U.S., China, and Japan gain the most. They are the big countries again. Huh? This is the U.S. has a huge EEZ, for example. Yeah. So that helps China is big in fish in way, Japan. And then, but the least developed countries fare better under all the scenarios compared to the compared to the status quo. So there will be outright winners here. That means more food. Where food is needed most. More income, where income is needed, most everything being equal, right? I mean, think of it. If you give a dollar, this is economics. If you give hundred dollars, let's say five hundred, because you guys have one. Let's say you, somebody gives you five hundred dollars, just like that. Today you go out to get. That's a student here at Colby, yeah. And then somebody gives. Uh, what is his name? Uh, Bill Gates, $500. What does it mean? Think of the value to the two groups of people. Right? So Bill Gates will not notice that. Then I can almost be sure that there will be a weekend party. And if it's one, if it's a student party. Right. Right. So, so that's the kind of thing. These countries, every single dollar means a lot more. Is the kid will get milk to drink or medicine or whatever. So that's, uh, that's huge. And the ten, top 20 countries that catch the most by value in the highest will lose at the moment, naturally. And that is where the pushback will come from. And these are powerful, influential countries. U.S. fishes in the highest, but we see a complete increase, a clear increase if, if it's close. It's not a big ISIS fishing nation. Canada hardly fishes in the ISIS, so that will be again too. But Spain, Japan, China, Thailand, these are the big ones. You know, South Korea. Yeah, so, so if you want to do this, you have to find a way to convince these countries. Now, a few words of conclusion here. Why should you be interested? Why should Americans, Canadians be, be interested in this? I told you fish do not respect borders, right? So that's the thing that our connections all over. And there's also the market, international market for fish. A lot of the fish eaten in the US comes from outside. So there's an interest on that country be interested, I think, in making sure these sources don't dry up, right? Because we'll get hit. That's one reason. And this there's weak legal and management control in the high seas and problems generated that can easily just propagate into the world. A classical example is Somali piracy. You, you probably know about it, Somali piracy. There's some evidence to show that this started because Somalia didn't have a government for a long time. There was a lot of illegal fishing, dumping of poisonous stuff in their waters, and a few fishers decided to come together to try to drive away illegal fishing and then it was taken over by criminals and it grew into a global big stuff. Billions of dollars being wasted 
uh, American fighter vessels spend a lot of time protecting the place. So this is another reason. And of course, distribution, the social factor. You know, climate change is coming. You know, they're talking about climate, climate change refugees. In Europe, they're talking more about that. People are moving because, and then, so you have the climate cost control, and then you have political problem. Bang! You have four million people living in Syria, right? Where do we put them right? So, so these are all good reasons why we should all be interested. So, help me to make the high seas a fish bank for the world. I call it the fish bank. But the fish can high, produce, move over in, and we get them, catch them cheaply, less CO2 and so on. And I also think one way to look at the high seas would be the conservative part of our portfolio, ocean portfolio. Anyone who is investing, especially if you are getting close to retirement, your financial advisor will say, haha, you don't just put all your money on big growth stocks, right? You have to keep some in conservative portfolios, buy the bonds, right? Even have some cash, just in case. And that 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 is not something you're looking for big growth on for your safety of mind, peace of mind. So that could be that could be one way to look at this. Think of house insurance. How many of you have seen a house burn now? Really? Hardly, but everybody signs on this for the peace of mind. Huh? So it's a kind of insurance. And as I have shown, increase in protein, incomes and jobs in places where this really matters. And the distribution of hospitals. So this might be a way to reduce the inequality we see around the world, which many thinking people are really worried about. Thank you so much for your attention. So we have time for some questions. Yes. Um. So you're saying that you're already seeing, yeah. already seeing kind of a, um, effects from overexploitation on the high seas, and only 10 to 15 percent of that global catch is coming from that area. What would that mean for the coastal populations that are really feeling the brunt of the kind of fishing industry? And what would that mean, I guess, when you're increasing the fishing pressure to try and make closing high seas catch neutral? Kind of, well, I guess they're already seeing negative impacts from the fishing industry. What would closing high seas and increasing the pressure on there? Yes, yeah, so what's the relationship, right? Because your point is, if you close the high seas, where will the, where will the boats go? They're likely coming into, into yeah. the east. Now, what we say is that you need to have good management of the east, right? Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a wasted effort. And we've seen examples of that, where boats are bought out by one country, and before you wake up the next day, they are fishing in another country. This is a real problem. So you need to have good management of the EEC, and we are far from that also. The only hope I have is that, as bad as some of the management in our EECs are, they still better than what happens out there. Right? So, you know, I hope to see some improvement, essentially. And you probably have heard about the, all the slave labor on, on, on boats on the high seas and further away from the coast, right? All the social issues related to that. So hopefully this, this will, these things can be tackled by this. At least they come closer and, and hopefully governments will get their acts together, especially if you push them. Huh? We all have something to do here, really. Okay? <coughs> yes, please. The high seas is just a massive, massive, like expansive ocean. How exactly would, like, if protection was implemented, how would it be? Yes. How do you implement this? Uh, yeah, the question I get quite often. You know, you know something. Uh, my professor, I, I'm not, I'm not him, so I wouldn't do the same thing. But maybe a little bit. You know, my my professor is a um, fisheries economist in Norway. And he would come up with schemes like this. One day, he was on TV being interviewed. He says, the Norwegian fishing industry is overcapitalized. We need to cut 60% of the boats. And the journalist was sitting there really panicking. 
that professor, how do you do this? Where, where do you keep all the, where do you take all these people? Well, what would they do? And he laughed, he had a big laugh. He said, that is not my job. <laughs> I've told you what you need to do, it's for the politicians to do it. So it's so funny, but okay, I've thought about this. <laughs> Yeah, you know, first you draw an idea, and then we all ask questions, we all think through, and, and most of the time that's how the world moves forward. But, but you have a good point, it's very large, it's huge. What I'm hoping is technology. Technology might be the way to, to, to deal with this. And, 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 and another good thing is once the whole area is out of mass, efficient, once you see a book in there, you know, you have to answer, right? But if it is partly allowed and so on, then people can do all sorts of tricks. So you have that. But technology is, is my hope, mostly. And I gave a talk uh, in Silicon Valley, and you know, so, and the guy, they said, so Rishi, what can we do to help you guys? And I said, you know what? Develop an app that will count all the fish for us. <laughs> <laughs> count all the boats on the water, right? So, and it's not a joke. They are actually pushing on. I'm currently working with a group there. Where we are trying to actually to send me some pictures, satellite. can count the books actually already in the high seas here. So, so there are lots of possibilities, I think. You know, as you guys go, when you get into research, never fear to drop an idea as crazy as it may look. Just get it out there. And I'll tell you, if it's a good one, it to be tested and shaky, and if it's a good one and it's alive, we'll find a way to do it. Okay? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, what are the biggest practical strategies to convince the countries that might lose from you know, closing the high seas? I'm from South Korea, and I see, yeah. you know, like, like this doesn't seem a good deal to me. You know, like, what what are the ways to convince them to to, um, to, yes, to yeah, buy, like, buy contribute to the, yeah. So, so one of my research areas is actually game theory, applying game theory to fisheries management. So you have countries, you know, some real, who are there, they are, you can't force Korea to do anything, you have to get them to see that it's good to do it. And sometimes you actually you have to pay them off. And if, you, if it's an economic model, game theory model, you say, look here, at the moment you are getting this from your fishing. Now, if we close it, the whole world will make X more. And out of that, we can compensate you if necessary. So you can use that kind of mechanism to get them. compensation. And, and the gains are big enough to do this. So still leave something out. Not to talk about all the biological and biodiversity gains. So that's one way. Another thing is to get, scare the shit out. <laughs> if they are, you know, big countries do this. They just. They just scare you off, right? So, so that's one. And another is to shape countries, you know, and this can be quite effective, right? If you, if you get enough South Koreans, especially the young ones, to say, this is not good for the world and we want our government to stop, yeah, that can lead to something. And in China, it's happening, right, with, with uh, sharp feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big of effort to reach young people, and many of them don't, don't listen. We don't need this to survive, right? We do, we shut in, out. So there are all sorts of ways here, yeah. okay? Korea is, is a business, a nice place. We'll get your government to do it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Yes, sir. I just have one that sort of follows up on the one previously. And you were talking about the degree to which this is potentially a security issue. Yeah. In terms of the way the Somali piracy may have come out of the collapse of the inshore fisheries, mm -hmm. would you feel comfortable selling this as a security issue and then getting navies to implement it in the same way that they patrol for Somali pirates yes. in the Western Indian Ocean? I mean, would that be something that would be a good thing to do or yeah. problematic? Yes, uh, hmm, this is a big question in many ways. <laughs> You know, the, the thing is, uh, once you bring the Navy, usually it will be Navy of big countries like the U.S. And then you have all the political stuff, right? All the species and all that. So that is, that's the type of issue. But having said that, actually Interpol is getting involved yeah. with illegal fishing in particular. 
So there are people pushing to make illegal fishing a criminal international activity. Mm -hmm. And Interpol has signed up actually to try to go after that. So, so it's possible to sell it to security. But one needs to be conscious of all the other mm -hmm. side stuff. Yeah. Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about security and how sort of the social inequalities, you mentioned a lot about social inequalities and you kind of alluded to it, but really stuff on some of the economic side. But yes. can you talk a little bit about the social inequalities associated with um, both fishing on the high seas and mm -hmm. then closing the high seas mm -hmm. um, to fishing? Mm -hmm. And then a, a, a second part to that is also following up on what you said about paying off these big countries mm -hmm. um, that benefit a lot. And for me, it's sort of problematic to say that we just pay off big countries because mm. then it raises, maybe for me, the deeper sort of ethical question as to um, where the finances come in from to pay off these big countries and why should we, um, we global community, pay off individuals who in themselves would have already been exploiting um, a resource that we did not benefit from. And so yes, you know, it, it brings these larger, okay, well, big global benefit, but yeah. the idea of sort of competition <coughs> justice and, yeah. and the idea of, you know, why should we, big global community, pay, pay you know, these 10 um, community, uh, countries that would have been benefited the most from the ICs? Yeah. yeah, good one, very good one. Why should we pay them? You know, you, you are right, you are right about that. And I, I struggle with that a lot. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, there was a, a, a conference we had in Senegal. You know? And so you have West Africans and Europeans, mainly, because Europeans are now signing agreements to fish within West African waters. You probably have heard that. Mm -hmm. And the agreements are skewed, of course, because of the power play. Right? Uh, I characterize this as usually they pay a lump sum. The countries don't know how much they take. You know, they just pay X dollars and then you can go take whatever. So I made an I made an analogy. It's like having a, a, a big shop, right? Walmart or whatever. And people come to the gate, they pay ten dollars and they come there and take anything, right? I mean so 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 that that is uh, but then the reason I mentioned this is there was a French guy who made a presentation and said, Why why are people complaining about France fishing in that place? We've been fishing there for centuries. We've been fishing for a long time. So it's almost like claiming the right to fish because they've been doing it before. And I raised my hand and said, you know what? I, I'm an economist. And now that you've told me, now you've been fishing the waters all this time, I will go and calculate how much value you've taken all these years. So you pay them. <laughs> so this is quite dramatic. The guy did for the rest of the meeting, we didn't want to talk with you. Right? <laughs> so, so in a way, that's why your question is, if it was a fair world where you can get these 10 countries, actually, we can demand that they pay us back for all the values they take. But my suggestion about compensation is actually about pragmatism, right? Given the, the situation, it's the independent countries, powerful ones, and how do you push them? And that was why I also talked about shaming them, right? That is an ethical kind of thing, saying, hey, come on, this is a global uh, thing, you shouldn't, you shouldn't just hijack it and make them feel bad about it. So, so that is on that one. Now, in terms of the high seas and equity and so on, one of my students, Anna, Shu Bawa, I tried hard to learn her last name, German, and she is looking at uh, economic viability of small-scale fisheries. And one of the things we find finding out as a big stumbling block is that subsidies, actually, that are paid to the fishing sector, which we estimate to be about $35 billion a year by coastal countries around the world, only 15% of that goes to small-scale fishes. 15. 85 goes to the large scale. And according to the FAO, 90% of all the fishing vessels are small scale. And when you look at the catch of small scale fishes as a group and the large scale, it's what? It's about 65 to 35 of the small scale. So when you do a rough calculation, 
for a ton of fish, the commercial life scale gets seven times more subsidies than the small scale, <coughs> which is crazy. I mean, we're going to publish this soon and make a lot of noise about that. So that tells you the social the inequity and what it means for the small scale fisheries. This is a big topic. And I know some of your students are looking at this. Uh, I had lunch with some of them, right? Good stuff. Actually, on, on that note, uh, let's thank our speaker.